Jesus has all that we will ever need, and I think that, that is presented very clearly in the Gospels and the way that he lived his life. He lived his life certainly as a giver. The difference between the giving of Jesus and human giving is that he has limitless resources. And we need to understand that in order to continue to forge a path ahead as a church. Biblical giving is always linked to uh, the idea of compassion that we see within our text this morning. And it's always driven by a desire to see God at work in and through us. We, we want that more than anything when we give, any other form of giving. I mean, when we give, we're doing something that would ordinarily be impossible. At least that's the way it, it should be. We're always putting ourselves in circumstances and situations where life is beyond us, but, but that is part of the Christian life, to live a life that is beyond you, a life utterly dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that all other forms of giving in life, uh, perhaps by Christians, but even non-Christians, it, it devolves into this sense of discontentment, that, that feeling of ingratitude within, and maybe even despair because, let's face it, people are flailing in their giving. They're aimless in the way that they give. Their giving doesn't have a real purpose to it. There's no answer to the ultimate questions that are being posed in their giving. And so they are only limited by their, they are limited by their own resources. And because of that, uh, they, they are giving out of their own strength and their own capacity. And that runs out for everyone at some point or another. And if the resources don't run out and people have millions and millions to yet give and give and even set up trusts and, and, and different things, there's still that emptiness, that void that is within a person because they suspect that this isn't enough, what they're doing. So when Jesus commanded his disciple to give thousands something to eat, uh, in the Gospels, they realized very quickly that they couldn't do what Jesus uh, deemed was necessary for them at that particular point in their lives. They couldn't do what only God could do, and they were going to see that, that God was able to furnish a table in the wilderness and, and was able to do something that they were not able to do. And that's what every Christian servant or minister needs to learn sooner or later. That means that God is able to take what we have, our meager resources, five fish, and two loaves, and, and then God doing something that is quite impossible, or just giving great and mighty things that are inaccessible to us, but he's doing it through us. The need is met, yes, right? And we're thankful for that. But more importantly, we're able to see God up close and personal in our lives. And that's what we need more than anything, I think, as a church. It seems to me that the text that we see here in Mark chapter 6 is hopeful for our church at this particular juncture because we want to keep a light that is strong here for the gospel and for the honor of God in, in Antioch and Oakley and Brentwood in the Bay Area here and even through our missions program. But our efforts are feeble right now and there are a lot of reasons for that, some of them valid and some of them not too valid. And so we need to see, I think, once again, that Jesus gives and he never runs out. And all that we ever will need in life comes directly from him. So what specifically does he give us in Mark chapter 6? Well, three benefits that I want to focus in on today. The Lord Jesus gives us rest, he gives us relief, and he gives us resources. And he never runs out of any of them. So let's look at, first of all, rest in Mark chapter 6 and verse 30. And we'll just look at uh, the, the passage through verse 33 for now. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest for a while, or rest a while. Now, I want you to notice they needed rest because they were doing things and they were teaching, right? So that when they watch Jesus do and teach, this will be a form of rest for them. 
I think we sometimes we forget that. Well, they had to hand out all this food. But I would gladly and with great rejoicing hand out that food because my spirit would be soaring when I saw what Jesus was actually doing in my midst. And, and that's going to be important for the apostles because that's how God is going to build his church. He goes on, for there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat so that they departed to a deserted place in a boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing. And many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. So what's happening here is governed primarily by what we read in verse 31. Jesus said to his disciples, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. And he did not forget about that invitation. And he made good on that invitation in the midst of all of the uh, frenzied activity that was coming from him. So what, what, why is he giving them rest? Well, the text, I think, answers that question. One aspect of the rest provides us with an opportunity to reflect on life, and we all need that. I always look forward to having one of these longer weekends because you have more time to linger in the morning with the Lord Jesus and think about things. And I think all of us need that. The apostles of Jesus became the foundation of the church because they saw Jesus at work. Jesus had sent them out to be his first-hand witnesses throughout all the world. But they were going to have to look very carefully at Jesus and learn from him before they could do that. The context of Mark 6 indicates that the apostles were returning from their own work. We read about that. So what does that mean? Well, they had really worked in a sense in the way that we work today. I mean, without the physical presence of God, right? Jesus is God. Jesus was always with them. But then he sent them out, so now they're away from Jesus. We know that the Holy Spirit resides in us. We know that God is always with us. But, but that physical presence is not there. And there is this aspect of human personality where we can reject God's priorities in the course of a day, or we can receive his priorities for that day and fulfill them. That's when we are truly satisfied. That's when we can sleep and our sleep is sweet because we know that we've accomplished God's will for our lives. And I think as the disciples come back, they're, they're coming to Jesus for the help and the refreshment and the refocusing that they need so that uh, the apostles... When they go out, they experience all the rejection. They experience all the depletion maybe that Jesus uh, experienced. I mean, the power went out from him when the woman grabbed down to the hem of his garment. All of these little details that we see in the gospel become very, very important. So just as with Jesus, the apostles feel all of the joys and all of the sorrows that enter into ministry and they compassionately give of themselves through their own preaching, healing, uh, casting out of demons ministry. And so they come back to Jesus and they need to receive more from him to continue to go on. They come back to Jesus and they are spent, they are depleted, and Jesus understands that maybe even before they understand it because they're excited, right, about what has happened. But, but what it needs to happen is there needs to be a, a, a replenishment that takes place in their lives. And so they're in a private place, a deserted place, a, a time where they could be alone with the Lord Jesus and reorder and reprioritize and Jesus will give them rest. Now Jesus called it a deserted place or a place of isolation at a critical time. For not only had the apostles just returned from uh, a time of great frenetic activity and busy ministry, but, but it's the political climate, right? Everything's in upheaval. It's the time of the Passover, and, and Herod is frightened as the king because he had just killed John the Baptist, we're told in the text. And so John had, has been beheaded. The people really like John. He's popular with the people. Herod's fearing this. The people are right for somebody to come in and to lead an insurrection. That sounds a little bit familiar. And so with all of that tension, Jesus doesn't enter into the fray and escalate things. Instead, 
he moves away from it. He moves to the eastern part of the Sea of Galilee. He moves away from uh, Herod and, and away from the crowds and the throngs. And he's not going to lead a movement. He's going to lead 12 men. And he's going to lead those 12 men away from the dangerous political powder keg that has been uh, brewing. So the multitudes in Capernaum saw Jesus. And they weren't going to let him get away with uh, being uh, away from them. So they started after him when they got on the boat and started to cross the Sea of Galilee, right? And, and we wonder about that, okay? How did they get over to the other side faster than that straight line of moving across the Sea of Galilee? And I, I don't know exactly the answer to that, but maybe they're rowing against the wind. Maybe things are windless and they're not able to really get traction or to have the wind help them get across. At any rate, the crowds beat Jesus and the apostles, and they're waiting for them. So it's not quite what the apostles had envisioned. Of course, it's everything that Jesus knew it would be. And so many knew Jesus and the disciples, for that matter. But, but the text is telling us that they knew them in the sense that they knew them on their own terms, the way that they wanted them to be. And I think that that's the way many Christians perceive Jesus today. I know Jesus, but you know him through your own preconceptions, you're not allowing the word of God to form an understanding of who Jesus is, but you're allowing your own emotions and, and, and the circumstances of life to form uh, who you think Jesus ought to be. And I think that that's happening with a lot of these people here that day. And so they have ulterior motives. Uh, for example, they're motivated by their curiosity. It's, it's, it's uh, a time when Things are in upheaval, like I mentioned, but it's also a time where it's Passover and there are lots of people. And it's a time of festivities and meals and not the regular work schedule. So, you know, you're not as preoccupied maybe as you normally are. And so you can start thinking about things and you're curious and you want to sit under the teachings of a rabbi. So they're motivated by that curiosity. But, but they're also motivated by politics Right? They want to force Jesus to be king. I mean, John 6 talks more about this than we see here in Mark. Uh, but they want him to be their king, their bread king, and to provide for them and to throw off Roman tyranny. And, and it also tells us in the text there in John chapter 6 that they saw the signs that Jesus had performed, and that motivated them too. So they were motivated by performance. All three of these things. These are inferior motivations, but they don't know it yet. And so we have to ask ourselves as we think about Jesus providing rest for us, and he does each and every day and each and every night when we sleep, we have that physical refreshment. Most of us are able to return to our homes in the evening. We spend them with family. We have more time to spend with the Lord in the morning. So we're able to be replenishing ourselves spiritually as we cling to his garment. If we spend very little time truly resting in the way that Jesus wants us to rest. That is to reflect on what he has said to us or to replenish our spiritual strength, that our work for him will end up empty. There will be a sense of dissatisfaction that always gnaws away at us as we seek to live life, the Christian life. If we're going to have real spiritual power as a church, it's going to come from the time that we spend alone as individuals with the Lord Jesus. And then the time that we spend together truly unified around the mind of Christ. You know, the, I was reminded again this morning in my Bible reading that the, the principle of sowing and reaping is still at work. In Galatians chapter 6, we know it very well. If you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. We like to dwell on the fact that we're sowing to the Spirit because maybe we're kind of mechanically going through the motions of reading our Bible and and prayer or, or time in church. We don't miss church. Whenever the doors are open, we're here. But, but we're, in all of that, we, we can still be sowing to the flesh, right? Lots of people living religiously, but they're not living righteously. They don't really have a relationship with God. So ministry not properly motivated by, by time spent alone with Jesus, well, that will, lead, that will reap fleshly corruption. Now, all of these false motives in our text 
point out unbelief in, in the multitude, of course. It stands in uh, stark contrast to the one who is helping them and the motivation that Jesus has uh, to help people. The text tells us that his motive is the compassion that he has for people in verse 34 because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. Well, I think that that's important to consider as we think about the rest that Jesus gives to us. They're hearing Jesus without proper motivations. So most come to church, and why are they coming? There could be a myriad of different reasons, but I I would say, and maybe I'm you know I'm not talking specifically about our church, although this is going to be true for our church too, but. But all churches in America, people are going to church for what they can get rather than what they can give, right? So the idea is we see people and all they're doing is sapping this energy. I think this is the perspective of the apostles, don't get me wrong. I don't want to look at it to where we just start beating up on people who are coming to church for what they can get rather than what they can give. We should be glad that they're coming to church. That's what I'm saying. In other words, when, when we look at this, we can make the same fatal mistake that the apostles made, and we can say we have all of these people that are sapping our strength and our energy and our resources, and we begin to grow inward, and, and we're thinking about our energies, our resources, and no longer thinking about the limitless supply that has been made available to us because of the cross of Christ. The windows are always open when we look up to heaven for us as believers. But maybe not so for people who are living a selfish life or a self-oriented life. And so we should be grateful that people are listening. That in and of itself provides rest for our labors, right? How awful it would be to be speaking and nobody listening, right? So inferior motives or not, we should be grateful that people are hearing the message of the gospel. And that is freeing and liberating in and of itself. You say, why? Because, listen, we, we come to an understanding where we realize that we can't change people, but Jesus can, right? It's not our job to change them. And so that gives us rest. We're not depending on ourselves to get the work done. So that when we fail in, in some avenue of ministry, we don't go home and, and feel guilty or, or beat ourselves up. We understand that we put ourselves in a place to be faithful. And, and we did our very best depending upon the Lord Jesus. And we know that we're going to be rejected. Right? But we still keep going forward nonetheless because he gives us rest. Now, there's physical rest, too. It's not just all of the spiritual rest that I'm talking about. but And you can't be effective if you don't have times of, of rest where you're relieved from uh, your responsibilities for a little while so you can take a breath, so that you can be alone to think, or even just be alone to take a nap and to recover physically so that you can think. There have been times in my life where I've had a day off and, and I've thought to myself, I'm really going to knuckle down here and think. And I just stare at my computer screen, at my Bible program, and an hour passes by. <laughs> and nothing much is getting done. And then I go take a nap, and I feel much better, and I can do the work that God has for me. We need physical rest. Rest comes, too, when you're exactly where you need to be, where Jesus wants you to be. That's, that's where the apostles were that day. It might not have been where they wanted to be at that particular time, but it's where Jesus wanted them to be, Steer clear, steering clear of that political movement and all the bustle of the crowds, even though this new crowd came upon them. They were exactly where they wanted, where God wanted them to be, and Jesus would give them rest even through this miracle. So Jesus gives, and, and this giving never runs out. The first thing that he gives us is rest. Secondly, Jesus also gives us relief. Look at Mark chapter 6, verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them 
many things. Notice, notice what the text says. He began to teach them many things. Right? That's the relief that they're receiving. Uh, not, not off the bat starting to feed them or to do the miracles of healing that Matthew talks about in the text or to cast the idea of casting out demons, but he's keys in on the teaching of the Lord Jesus. He began to teach them many things, it says at the end of the verse. So the relief that Jesus is talking about is a relief that comes in the form of compassion from him as he delivers leadership through his teaching. He taught them many things. The leadership, because they were as sheep without a shepherd. The motivation for sheeping the, uh, teaching them rather is the compassion that he had for them, the mercy and the love that he had for the crowds that were assembled that day. So let's think about this idea of relief in the form of compassion, first of all. I'm not going to survey the word compassion in the New Testament. I, I, have, I have a study, and if you'd like it, email me, and I'll, I'll copy it out of my notes and send it to you in, in the email. But this idea of compassion occurs 12 times in the New Testament. And you know what? It always refers to Jesus. That ought to be a lesson for us. In other words, as I'm thinking about the compassion of the Lord Jesus, I want to make that my motive in life, too. When Jesus, when he comes and, and the boat arrives and he sees the multitude, I mean, I can understand the feeling that might have come upon the apostles, or, uh, or, or we might even be thinking that it might come upon Jesus, and Jesus, as their spokesman, would say something like this to the multitudes, you can all just go home now, right? Go home. Um, I'm not ready. Uh, my friends and I, we came here to rest. You've interrupted things, right? My, my, my uh, shingle is, is not going to be hung up today. The teaching of the Lord Jesus is closed, right? I'm tired. That's not what happens. And, we wouldn't even think of that happening, and yet that's how we feel sometimes. People have these great needs around us, and we're thinking about our own needs and how tired we are. And so we, we have this idea of go away now, uh, don't come back, I'll, I'll come to you when I'm ready. And that's not effective ministry. It's absurd to even think this way. And so Jesus ascended the hill, the text tells us, he assumes his position of teacher when we look at the parallel text, and he begins to teach them. He teaches them. And he teaches them not begrudgingly, but with a sense of compassion. Compassion, this idea of feeling sympathy and, and, and uh, feeling great uh, need, and, and knowing that he has what the people need, and he has from his father what the people need. Remember, he's a human being. He is man. He's not only God. And so he's able to teach these people, even as man, because he's dependent upon his father. And so Mark chapter 4, verse 34, states that he does so with compassion. I think compassion led him uh, to teach them in, in, in this way so that people could have relief, but so that the apostles could have relief as well. Looking upon the multitude, looking upon the apostles, and understanding where all of that intersects, where Jesus comes together with the apostles and the multitude, that's the point of ministry. And I think that Jesus himself finds rest from the Father in all of that. And, and that, that's what we need to see in the text. When it comes to words of condemnation, you don't see those from Jesus when he's speaking to individuals. Search the scriptures. You, you might see him speaking to an individual with words of condemnation, but that individual is always representing the religious world, the religious leadership. And Jesus is confronting these leaders who should be teaching with compassion, and he is reserving his condemnation for them because they're not. I think that that's the point. So Jesus gives relief in the form of compassion. But 
But not only that, Jesus gives relief in the form of leadership as well. When we think about this statement that this multitude is as sheep who are in need of a shepherd, they're in need of help then. They're in need of nourishment, sustenance, and their need of encouragement and a safe place and protection, all of these things. Throughout the scripture, we see this metaphor of sheep without a shepherd being used. Moses was facing the end of his ministry, and he was presented with relief in the form of Joshua because he knew that he could die knowing that the people will be well cared for. And the people themselves could sense the relief because Joshua would step in and lead the people toward victory because it's the same God that is leading them. Or you turn to uh, really the godless days of Ahab and Jezebel in Israel's history. And there was one prophet named Micaiah. And this prophet stood up and said what needed to be said to Ahab in, in uh, the, the text of scripture. It's in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 17. But Ahab didn't want this truth. Ahab didn't want to hear what the prophet Micaiah had to say. Just doom and gloom, that's all. Uh, Micaiah speaks and so he didn't want anything to do with him but Micaiah spoke nonetheless he said I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep having no shepherd what is he talking about well they don't have a shepherd now with this king who is evil but they're not going to have a shepherd soon because he's going to be dead and the people are going to be uh, scattered upon the mountains just like sheep because they don't have leadership they're not looking to God. They're looking to false gods. When the Babylonian captivity occurred, Ezekiel 34 and verse 5 records that Israel was sheep scattered because there was no shepherd. And again, it was the failures of, of their religious leaders. It was the failures of their kings that led them to the predicament that they were in. Zechariah said that the people um, went their own way like sheep. They are troubled because there is no shepherd, Zechariah 10 and verse 12. Chapter 13 and verse 17 in the same prophecy uh, talks about the fulfilled prophecy in the life of Christ. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Of course, that's exactly what occurred when Jesus was killed on the cross of Calvary and the disciples were scattered. Mark chapter 14 and Matthew chapter 26 records this. All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. John chapter 10, one of the great I am statements of the Lord Jesus. It, it, it proclaims that he is the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. The religious leaders wouldn't do that. They were hirelings. They're hirelings in that metaphor in John chapter 10. And, and they should be teaching people with compassion and leading them in the right way, but instead they abandon the people to the wolves and the wolves devour them. Jesus is that good and great shepherd that will never abandon his sheep. He's the great shepherd of the sheep through an everlasting covenant established by the shedding of his blood, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. And Peter reminds us that, yes, there may be under shepherds, but there is only one great shepherd. And this great shepherd is for the sheep who have gone astray, but have now returned to the shepherd of their souls. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25. So in all of those passages of scripture, Jesus assumes the role of shepherd. And no other man can assume that role. <laughs> it's amazing to me. Uh, as a pastor, I especially feel this. I feel it because I sometimes put it on myself. I can't be what people need. Do we understand that? And you can't either. There can only be one Lord Jesus Christ. And all good under shepherds should be pointing people, the sheep, to him. And we should all understand that he has everything that we need. That's the point of this passage. All that we ever need will come from the Lord Jesus. We look at the, the helpless, the hungry, the aimless, and the defenseless, and we wonder, we're bewildered by all of it because we forget that we were in the same position and that we're in the same position even today. We might think that we have it all together and that we have what we need to do life, but 
It's amazing, as a Christian, I find out very quick that I don't. And that's what this passage teaches me. We need a cause. We need fulfillment. I would not have a cause. I would not have fulfillment apart from Jesus Christ and his leadership in my life. He provides all of that and more. Jesus leads those who are stuck in the mire of sin and in himself, and, and he leads all of us. He leads you. He leads me. He leads us because he's the captain of our souls. He gives us life. And he leads us to the place of surrender. And he'll do that every day for you. He'll do that every day for me. So Jesus gives and he never runs out. He gives us relief in the form of compassion and leadership. He gives us the rest that we need. And then finally, in verses 35 through 44, he gives us the resources that we need. It says, when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place. And already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. That seems so insensitive to us. What can they do? We don't have the resources. But nonetheless, Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And, and they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat. But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Have you surveyed the situation? Have you gone out? Have you seen the need? Have you brought people to the realization of their need? And that's exactly what they do. And when they found out, they said five and two fish, five loaves and two fish. I think it said five fish a while ago. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them, before these ranks of people and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all, two fish among thousands of people. So they all ate and they were filled, the text says. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments, an object lesson for each apostle, right? 12 fragments, uh, full baskets full of fragments in the, of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. So Jesus gives all of the resources that we need to be effective in ministry. He still does that today. And so now the day is over. Jesus is teaching. He's healing for hours. The day is far spent, we could say. And, and so he's in a place where he should send the people away because they can't stay where they're at and survive. They need to eat, right? This is truly a hand-to-mouth time. Now it becomes very apparent what Jesus said earlier to Philip, right? Do you remember what he said to Philip? He, he, he said to Philip, he tested him with a question, you know, is this a, a, enough bread to feed the multitude? Is this enough uh, fish to feed the multitude, Philip? Don't, don't we have enough? And, and Philip failed the test because he didn't think that there was enough. He didn't put two and two together and, and find that out of the resources that were supplied from the Father, anything was possible. That was the idea. And so frustrated, or at the very least worried, they, they said, you, you need to send these people away. You're not doing them any good by keeping them here. And so the disciples are having this discussion among themselves, trying to figure out things on, on their own. And they come to Jesus with their rationale, their rationale. And it's all natural and it's all temporal and it just sees, it doesn't see beyond today. No eyes looking up to heaven, giving God thanks as bread is being broken. None of that is going on because they are tethered to the temporal. And they don't see what God is able to do because God is infinite and eternal and compassionate and still wants to meet needs today. Often I think we are prompted in life by what we see. We walk by sight, we don't walk by faith. And so uh, God, when, when we do this, we are, we are really pulling from our own resources and God wants us to pull away from our own resources and to see what he is able to do in and through us, and so we have to depend upon him. Jesus gives us 
resources that we can never collect for ourselves. There are things that I just cannot do for people. And yet, I'm able to do because of what God does in and through me. And when we get to verse 37, Jesus commanded the disciples to give the multitude something to eat. And when he does that, the crowd didn't need to go away, apparently. They could stay right there. They could enjoy a time of fellowship. But a miracle would have to happen. And they should believe that Jesus is able to perform this miracle. But, but we, we, we say, why don't they believe? Why don't they trust in Jesus? And yet we go every day trying to amass and pool all of our resources and keep it all together. And I could apply that in many different directions. But we're trying to do it. And we can't. And Jesus is bringing us to the end of ourselves. That's why I think they say, shall we go out and buy? How is that possible? How can we go out and buy? They've got to come to the end of themselves. Eight month wages of money, they don't have that to go and find bread. And then where are they going to buy that kind of, uh, of bread? Are they going to find it from one vendor out in the wilderness? And the answer is no, they're not able to do it. Even if they had the money, they're not able to do it. And so something miraculous needs to happen. It's good to get in situations that are beyond us. You might not like it. I don't like it. I don't like to feel in a, like I'm in a situation that's beyond my control and everything's falling down all around me. But, you know, to see Jesus do the impossible in my life is worth it. And I think that that's the way that we ought to look. And then as we get to verse 38, sometimes we just need to see just how little we truly have. I mean, five loaves plus two fish plus Jesus, that's, that's enough. That's more than enough. And that's the point that's being made there. In verses 39 and 40, Jesus commanded the disciples to direct the crowds, to organize them, to do efficiently the ministry that was before them. Lots of lessons there, too. Everything being approached in an organized manner and, and the faith of the apostles being tested because they have to sit them in ranks and they're thinking to themselves, wow, we're, I can't believe we're doing this, but we're sitting them down. Now what's going to happen? All right. So they're struggling with all of this and, and the multitude is sitting and the apostles are seating them and both are faced with the same dilemma how are our needs going to be met? Because remember, the apostles have just made the crowd aware of their needs if they had forgotten about them. And so everybody is struggling with those inner feelings that all of us have. And that is, how are we going to see all of this work out? That's when faith commits. Say, I don't know, but I trust in God. I believe in him. And so that's exactly what happens. You'll, you'll never see the, the re resources that God wants you to have if you can't get beyond your own resources to meet the needs of the people. That's the point. He goes on in uh, verse 41. He takes those meager resources, that barley bread, the, the fish as well. They distribute it. You know, the verb tense in this text is, is really important because the, the idea is that Jesus continued to give out these broken bread pieces. I don't know exactly how it looked, but it was always there. He was always supplying to the apostles and they were running out and meeting the needs of the people. So it, it was something that was very miraculous. Jesus continues to give, but, but never runs out. As a matter of fact, he gives to the point that it's abundant and that it's beyond what people need so that there is not only enough to nourish the people, but there's also uh, food that is left over. He's doing something that is completely inaccessible, the great and mighty things that we look for in God. In verses 42 and 43, the text tells us that they all ate and were filled. Literally, the text there says they ate, all of them, all of them ate. And that's the emphasis in the text. All is stressed in the verse. You say, well, why? Because Jesus wants us to know that nobody will go away hungry if he's working in and through us. And nobody did. That's the whole point. And the apostles are going to learn that too. 
And then in verse 44, we learn that God is still working miracles even in our day. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, in this text, we know it's a miracle, not just because the thousands of men ate, but certainly women and children were there too. The text is, is pretty clear here. It's men, generically, all men that, that were fed in the text. But, but the specific Greek word means, yes, literally these males had their needs met, but certainly they had women and children with them that would also eat and have their needs met. I, I often think about that as a father, right? I can meet the needs of my family and provide for them. God put that in me, this drive to provide for my family. But all I'm doing is receiving from Jesus and handing to them. That's a great picture here in the text. I don't have anything to give to them if I don't first receive it from the Lord Jesus. That's the point of the text, I think. And he just keeps on giving, he keeps on giving, and it's more than we could ever ask for or even think of. Now, natural people aren't going to understand that. That's why they're so filled with anxiety today. But as Christians, we should understand that Jesus will always have what we need, and then some. That's the way he is. Jesus gives rest. Jesus gives relief. And Jesus gives resources. He gives, and he never runs out. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning and for this text of scripture. We sure need it today. You didn't come to this earth to make us safe, and uh, we realize that. But you came to make us disciples, and if we're going to be made disciples, we're going to be put in predicaments that are beyond us. We're going to be taxed in life so that we need rest. We're going to be put in positions where we need relief, where we need understanding and wisdom. And we're going to need resources, not just physical resources, but just this inner drive and fortitude to keep on doing what you've commanded us to do. So, Lord, as we pray uh, to you this morning, help us to look up even as you looked up when you broke the loaves. And continue to give to your apostles. Help us to understand that we serve the very same God and that you, Lord Jesus, are never faced with an emergency, a difficulty, a trial, a need, or a temptation that would not yield to our dependence upon you. Give us a praying life and give us all that we need and convince us that you never run out. Lord, we ask for all of this for your sake.